Spencer and his family yeah. foundation. Just a few housekeeping things while we wait to get started. Um, Mr. Spencer will be moving into the gallery, but then if you would like to remain in your chair, you are very welcome to do so or follow him around the gallery. Um, so this is really, I think, going to be a, a, not a formal lecture, but an informal tour. So uh, let me uh, get started. So it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce uh, Mr. Jordan Schitzer, who has been a very generous lender of art to the JSMA and other museums around the country. He has one of the most comprehensive collection of prints by 20th and 21st century American artists in this country. He began collecting art at the age of 14 when he purchased a small painting from the Fountain Gallery of Art the first contemporary art gallery in Portland, which was perhaps not coincidentally started by his mother, Arlene Schnitzer. And it was his mother's leadership in the local arts community and her passion for the arts, especially regional artists, that really inspired Jordan's own passion for collecting and the arts. Today, the Jordan Schnitzer Family Foundation manages an active lending program guided by two goals that are close to Jordan's heart making the work easily available to qualified institutions, especially in underserved communities, and supporting exhibition-related activities that foster education and inquiry. And of particular interest to him is making sure that children have access to the work of these talented artists of our time. And to that end, we really are very delighted that the foundation is providing support for the educational programs that we are offering in conjunction with this exhibition. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jordan Delighted that you're all here this morning, and uh, I see so many faces of people that I know so well, like my Hope Pressman idol and others, and it's uh, nice of you to come share this time with us. What I want to do, because there may be some folks here who haven't heard part of the early story, and Jody talked about part of it, is I'll talk a little bit about how I got started, and then um, a bit about the relationship with this wonderful institution, and then focus most of the time on the art and why I love it and are so glad that you're all here. So as Jody said, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, an only child. And when I went to first grade, my mother had a little time on her hands, so she enrolled in the Portland Art Museum Art School. And that is what began this journey, this magical journey, as I say. I began to be babysat by now many of the major artists in the community, and I'd go to the artists' homes and meet their kids and so forth. It added a whole dimension to the sort of business real estate side that my father was building up on the, uh, the other side of the, the, the family. So um, three years later, a couple of the, the major artists that are represented in the fabulous Hazeltine collection here, Mike Rousseau, Louis Bunce, Carl Morris, complained, should we, is there an echo from this mic? Let me just take it away and sure. They, they complained that while the museum had a rental sales gallery, there was no contemporary art gallery. This was in the early 60s. So she opened up, along with her mother, Helen Director, my grandmother, the Fountain Gallery of Art, so named because they opened up a block from the Skidmore Fountain in Old Town, Portland, and they were in the Newmarket Theater building, which is one of the oldest buildings in Portland. And um, that was just an amazing time. Now, the tie-in, oddly enough, to works on paper never dawned on me till a few years ago. I was thinking back as I've repeated the story about my mother and how lucky I am that she fortuitously happened to go to art school, happened to open art gallery, let me be blessed with growing up with our fabulous local contemporary artists in our home and in my life. But when she was there with some of the artists, painting and doing sheetrock and fixing up the space before it opened up a week or two later, I remember going over to this funny sort of chest in the corner, and it had these thin little drawers. And I thought, well, how do you put any shirts or sweaters in that? And so I pulled it open, and I'm looking down at this drawer, at this really pretty fuchsia image, sort of like finger painting, and she came over and was standing behind me and said, do you like that? I said, I love it, what is it? And she said, well, it's a print. And I said, it's beautiful. She said, well, if you like it, you can have it. And it was a print by a man named Stanley Hayter, who little did I know then was one of the most important artists, a French artist in pretty the world. So in essence, coming back to works on paper, that's where I got my start. Anyway, she ran the gallery for 25 years. 
And that's where I think she met Hope Pressman the first time and many of you that came to the gallery for all those openings and, uh, and did a wonderful job. And she's been uh, very, very rewarded um, and got a number of uh, deserved honors for helping people realize the importance of our supporting local artists. And while these artists are local to more like New York and around the country, uh, the work we have in the Hazeltine collection and in the permit collections here and that I have in my homes and I hope many of you do, I think are just as good as anything anywhere that's being done. But when she closed the gallery, uh, that was a major change for me. And I was on the board of the Portland Art Museum as well as this museum. And uh, I remember coming up from a board meeting in the Portland Art Museum and there was a show curated by the late Gordon Gilkey. And some of you may remember him. We put on a wonderful tribute dinner for him downstairs here years ago. And he'd been head of the um, art department of Oregon State. Uh, and prior to that, um, he was one of those monuments men that the movie was just made about, you know, of after, in the army after World War II that really helped get a lot of the Nazi looted art and get it restored to, uh, to many people and, and countries. So um, he had curated a contemporary print show with Bob Cox of the Ogden Gallery. And I, when I saw that exhibition, I thought, wow, I want to keep my commitment to our artists of our region that I love, but this might be fun. So I went down to the Ogden Gallery and I bought a small Frank Stella and a Jim Dine okay, and a David Hockney from an image called the Blue Guitar Series, a little Picasso-like image. And it was just neat. And I think it also, looking back from a psychological standpoint, was sort of beginning to differentiate myself a little bit from what I had grown up with. I went back the next week and bought a few more and a few more. And then what really changed my whole life was what happened in this building. Because we had a wonderful director there named David Robertson, many of you may remember. He was here eight or ten years. And uh, he had heard that I was collecting prints and he asked if he could borrow some. And I said, sure. And he came up and he went through a little binder that I had, had been making and picked out 56 works. And in June of 1995, we had an exhibition downstairs of 56 of these works. And I came into that gallery where G. Hope and I and many of you had put on so many events and we'd attended so many exhibitions. But it was amazing to see the works from my collection, most of which had been in storage, up on those wonderful walls. And as I've suggested before, I felt this um, amazing feeling of walking into a party of friends, even though I didn't know any of those artists. And I think that really is a statement about the importance of art in our lives and what it does for us. Even though I didn't know them, having had that art in my house, I had really developed a very special intimate relationship with the art and those artists. It's another reason why I think surrounding ourselves with art is so important, the other dimension it adds to us. But the real transformational moment came when people came in like all of you and were looking and smiling or gawking or frowning at the work in this gallery. And uh, a man was there with his son, eight-year-old boy, and they were in front of an image by an artist named Robert Longo. And Robert Longo did a series called Men in the Cities. Now, if I asked you to stand up right now and act sort of crazy, you'd think I was crazy, but it would seem very contrived, right? But Robert Longo came up with this idea of trying to get people in these really uh, fanciful, contorted uh, positions. So he got his models, put him in a room, got a tennis ball machine, and started shooting tennis balls at him. And as the, those tennis balls came at the people, they ducked and moved and ended up in all these amazing positions that if we tried to emulate them, if Tad Savinar, the artist, asked a model to do that, it'd be really sort of just, as I said, contrived. So there's an image of a man named Eric or Robert, one of the names in this big series, and it's a man like this. And I love the work. So this young man and his father were sitting in front of that work. And I scooted down next to that young man and I said, gee, what do you think's going on there? Is that guy dancing and rocking out? Or is he twisting in pain and about to collapse? Because that's what I see in the work. And the young man looked at it and he, like all the, the young people that you all been around, you could just hear those wheels turning and he said, I think he's dancing. To which I said, I think you're right. 
Because if he said, I think that man is going to go be the next man on the moon, I would have said, I think you're right. Because whatever he saw in that work, like whatever any of you see in this Lichtenstein behind me or the Sarahs over there, you are right. And none of us can tell anyone else that what you see is not a valid interpretation of what the work is. So back to that young man, the light went off and I thought, you know, I love contemporary art. And we haven't had a lot of it in the Northwest growing up. It's not like we're in New York or the big eastern cities that have lots of big contemporary art that were way ahead of us. And I thought it would be really neat if I could combine my passion for buying art with really a public exhibition program that focused especially on university museums and regional museums, less served communities. So with that, I sort of ramped up my buying work like this, and we're now up to 8,000 prints. And uh, we um, have really never planned on the exhibition program growing as much as it has, but we've had 90 exhibitions, as Jody mentioned, at 60 museums. We generally have four exhibitions like this going on at any one time. And we do that all for free, and then we provide these brochures, which I hope you take home, and then we often give them additional money to bring school kids in, seniors in, artists in residence, speakers, whatever. Now, you might ask how an exhibition like this happened. I mean, how to get here? Who picked it? Well, it's really, like many things in life, just circumstances. So I was having lunch in Portland, and I saw the director of our Portland Art Museum, Brian Frisio, and we're very close to him and very supportive of the Portland Art Museum. And I went over to say hello, and he said, I want to have you meet this young man, Toby Jurevix. And I said, hello, Toby. I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm the contemporary curator at the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, which I'd never heard of before, which, I mean, there are tons of museums. None, I mean, they're important institutions that we just may not know about because they're in different places. And I said, gee, why don't you come on over to the office and see our program? He did. And when he left, he said, now, gee, we really could borrow a lot of this work and you'd send it to Omaha? Sure, I'd love to be. I've never gone to Omaha. The director, Jack Becker, came out a few weeks later, and he spent three days going through our binders while we have a database that this is all on. We also have old-fashioned binders like I started with, so when curators come, they can take binders into one of our conference rooms and sort of flip through it and pick out things they like for whatever theme or show. So Jack Becker picked out this work, okay, and then I said to him, as long as it's going to go back to Omaha, I don't know museums there, but you must know through your associations, you know, other museums in the Midwest. He said, of course I do. I said, as long as we're putting it together, shipping it there, let's have it go to other places. So he called back a few weeks later, and he said, there's a wonderful museum in Wichita. I said, is there? And he said, they'd like to have the exhibition. So we went online, looked it up, beautiful building, great. He said, how about Salt Lake? I said, I had a Warhol show there. We love Salt Lake. We're in our business buying some property there. He said, how about Missoula? I said, well, I've had an exhibition in Bozeman, but not Missoula. Sounds good to me. Okay. And then uh, the Bellevue Art Museum that we've had a number of shows at wanted it too. And then I was thrilled when Jill uh, last year decided and then Jody did the brilliant installation job she did, that it would come here to my namesake and stomping grounds where this whole you know, um, uh, exhibition program really started. So that's how it, uh, how it started. One other side note about it that I think is really important is when these curators and directors come and go through and pick the art, we exercise no editorial control. I mean, whatever they want to pick, I love it all. Um, but what was interesting about Jack Becker and the museum in Omaha is a beautiful older building like many communities. There was sort of a performing arts center built in the 20s. In the 60s, the city gave it to an arts group. They then hired in the early 90s Sir Norman Foster, the brilliant English architect, and he did a huge addition next to the older building connected by a 50-foot glass exhibition area with two giant Chihuly sculptures. Wonderful, wonderful institution and building. And, uh, but what was neat about Jack Becker is in addition to the Richard Serra and Lichtenstein and Donald Judd and Chuck Close and Saul LeWitt and, and uh, Barbara Kruger, he also picked two of our Northwest artists. 
and he picked Joe Federson right here, okay? and he picked Rick Bartow, <laughs> that since you're having a full exhibition of Rick Bartow in, what's the date, please? April, April 18th, it opens to the public. April 18th, you've all got to be here. Rick Bartow, amazing <coughs> local Native American artist. We love his work. He was in the show, too. Uh, Jill and Jody decided not to include his work because you're going to have a feast on April 18th with a whole exhibition of his work. But the fact is, for all those other venues, not only did those audiences see the best of the last 50 years of our major artists, but two of our own local Pacific Northwest Native American artists who we just think the world of. So very exciting. Now, um, let's talk a bit about uh, why I like collecting this work and uh, what it means to me and how I sort of look at it. And I should stop at any time and see if there are any questions, but let me get through this next, next section. Oftentimes when people, and I know you've maybe thought this or had friends ask you this about contemporary art, and people have looked at something like those Richard Serra's behind you, those big black squares or whatever, or Ellsworth Kelly's work, or there's Donald Judd's, these abstract minimalist pieces here, and people have said, ugh, God, why can't they do these nice landscapes? We've got gorgeous beaches, mountains, great trees. Shh. Why can't they do some nice, pretty things, right? You've never thought that, have you? <laughs> well, the fact is that two, if there are two sound bites you leave with, it's these. First, artists are always chroniclers of our time. Okay? They are always dealing with the issues of the moment. The piece here, Signs by Robert Rauschenberg, maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. But if you look at one piece that tells you everything for those of us who are old enough to remember what the 60s were like in that fog of marijuana smoke, um, uh, artists are always forcing us to deal with the social mores, the political themes, the tension, the stereo issues, the stereotypes, the, the man's intolerance to each other, all the issues of, of the time. And if you go back in history, artists were always always doing this. So first, they're chroniclers of our time, no different than those political columnists in the New York Times every morning. Second of all, they're always doing contemporary art. So you say, Ugh, why can't we go back to those nice portraits like John Singer Sargent, Dury Michelangelo, Renoir, Van Gogh, you pick anyone you want. They were all contemporary artists. They were pushing the envelope at that time. Why? Because the challenge artists have, and think about it is, they've got to have some message that wants to come out, some passion, something they want to convey to others. They want to rip their souls open, pour their guts out on canvas, in sculpture, on paper, so that all of us and generations before us and generations after us will look at that work and ponder it, like it, hate it, whatever. And second of all, the most challenging thing is they've got to do it in a way that hasn't been done before. Because if this all looked like Van Gogh and Jill and Jody came up with an idea of saying, hey, let's do a knockoff show of Van Gogh, I guess we could see what counterfeit art is like, okay. But we've already had a Van Gogh, we've already had a Picasso, we've already had a Mondrian. You don't need another one. Now that doesn't mean if we want to go home and we want to sort of copy a Mondrian with whatever for ourselves, that's fine. After you're done listening to me ramble on, you want to go have coffee and you take a pencil out and you doodle on the napkin, you're an artist. Now if you bring that doodle over to Jody and to Jill and you say, hey, can I have a show of my doodles? They'd probably say, <laughs> we want you to keep coming back to Marche Cafe and enjoy yourself, but our walls are sort of full right now. In other words, to make it at this level, okay, you've got to have that message and you've got to be doing it in a way that hasn't been done before. That's a heck of a challenge for an artist. Okay, so once again, any of us can be artists. Our kids, when they're doing crayons, when we want to doodle, that's fine, you're all artists. You're all writers, you're all readers, you're all poets. But to move on up, you've got to have a skill set and a talent, a vision, and a way of doing it that's been different and happen to be at the right place at the right time. 
So the artists that are in here, and this leads us to talk about this work, are all people that are the leading artists of the last 50 years and the last half of the 20th century and now the 21st century. And they are just brilliant, brilliant people. Okay, so let's talk a bit about uh, the one right in front of us and then I'll maybe get us to move a little bit and move around, okay. So let's talk about Roy Lichtenstein. So Roy Lichtenstein was born in 1923, died in 1997. Now the way that I, and I again credit my mother with this, the way that I react to art is first, I just see things and I just respond. I mean, I just, things just touch me and get me excited or things I sit there and can't figure out what's going on and I've allowed myself through my training, it's okay, you don't have to like everything. And it's fun not to like stuff because that tells you the stuff you like, you're being discriminating. But I've also found that stuff I haven't liked, if I see it again and again, suddenly sometimes that artist that work ends up speaking to me and I think to myself, gee, what wasn't I seeing before and what am I seeing now? And that's fun, that's great. The second thing is when I look at art though is after I respond to it, okay, I begin to think about, gee, what's going on there? What was the artist thinking? Why did they maybe do what they did when they did it? And I gave an example because it's so appropriate here at the University of Oregon where I went to school, I was an English major and what I referred to is right across the quad here at the Prince Lucian Campbell building, the only ugly building on campus, uh, in the PLC 180, which was the big lecture hall down below on the right, my favorite teacher was a man named Clark Griffith. And he taught for 28 or 30 years here, and he taught American novel. And God, when he did talk about Hawthorne and Mark Twain and, and, and Sylvia Plath and, and Fitzgerald and Faulkner and Hemingway, oh my God, it was fabulous. And I loved it. And I'd get home and I'd read those books for class and I'd read Absalom, Absalom or The Great Gatsby or whatever and I would know everything going on in that work. And I'd go into that classroom and as I mentioned in another talk, he'd start talking and I'd sit there thinking, wait a second, I'd look around, <laughs> are we reading the same book? <laughs> I didn't think about that theme and that theme and that theme and that theme and that's why he was so good because he'd spent his life and he was trained and had learned from others and so forth. So he was able to take us like good professors do and take us into elements of those novels that as lay readers we might not have thought about the depth of what was going on there. So when you think about art, I take the same approach. So we think about Roy Lichtenstein, okay? And uh, you know, he. Um, uh, grew up in New York, his father and mother was a realtor and he gets into art when he's young and he goes to Ohio State, art major, and it was there that he had his most important influence, a professor named Hoyt Sherman. And what he says about Hoyt Sherman is, he taught me how to see. And I guess the third sound bite this morning is what all these artists are trying to do is teach us how to observe, how to see. So here he is in the late 40s now, finishing up school, got his uh, master's in 48, 49, okay, goes and teaches at Rutgers and so forth. But now think about and put him in context. The big artist then, here he wants to be an artist. And who's he looking at that's in the news, that's pushing the envelope, that's being criticized, were the abstract expressionists. Okay, the Rothko, all those, you know, Jackson Pollock, all those folks. They were the ones that people were saying, this isn't art, this is horrible. But the young art students were looking at and saying, wow, they're really the ones at the forefront here doing things that haven't been done. But they came along, Lichtenstein, Warhol, Jasper Johns, they couldn't do the abstract expression stuff because that was a generation prior to them. So they had to do something different. Second, what's going on politically? Think about post-World War II. He's now teaching at Rutgers, New Jersey. He's living, in essence, in New York. It's 51, 52, 53. Think about the influences then. You've got the explosion of all the servicemen and women coming back. You've got the Levittowns opening up. Suburbs are exploding. And TV is going into everybody's houses. The biggest single change was mass marketing and media. We just take it for granted, and my God, today, what we do with our smartphones dwarfs what they were experiencing. But that was the big experience about what's happening now when you're being bombarded by TV ads all the time about Clairol products for your hair and drive a Chevrolet and smoke 
uh, you know, Marlboros and travel here and go here and whatever. So most of those pop artists were really focusing on materialism, the individual, how do you maintain your identity in light of, 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 of society trying to force you and tell you what to do and who to be and who to think and what to wear and what to eat. Okay, now we've got the context of their time. Now in this particular series of Lichtenstein, he did something that many artists do. They pay homage to other artists who they admire. That's different than copying someone's work. Now this series of bulls is uh, his paying homage to Picasso who had done the exact same thing some years before. Picasso has an amazing series where he took a bull, a very representative, uh, representational image first, and then through six different images, he, he destructs it and destructs it and destructs it till the final one, you can't tell it's a bull. Roy Lichtenstein was so admiring of that that he wanted to do, in essence, a version of it in his own style, just as he did with Matisse. Matisse did this ruined cathedral in France, had an interesting idea. He did that, th those paintings at four different times during the day. And uh, Lichtenstein liked that, and he did his own ruined cathedral series. So in this series, he's first uh, paying homage to Picasso. Now, what do I think is going on here? First, as Picasso did, he's showing us a bull. You look at this, you immediately know it's a bull. But then he starts doing his magical way of pulling it apart and breaking it apart in these fabulous, abstract, geometric uh, shapes and forms that he's so well known for. Now I think first on a sort of theme standpoint, what he's hitting us with again is the individual, back to that time. So my interpretation is that, hey, we all in this day of media and, and, and the pace of our lives, we're so quick to jump to conclusions. We look at a bull and we just don't think anything about it. Now maybe this bull is really uh, analogous to a, to a person. Okay. And this bull is actually made up of many, many parts. Not just this sort of simple thing we dismiss. We're all very complex human beings. And that's a theme I see in lots of this work here. Trying to talk to us about us as individuals and how quick we are to judge and form stereotypes and, and end up falling into patterns that we often don't like about ourselves. The second thing I think he's really hitting with again is this whole movement that Warhol's probably most famous for, the democratization of art. Trying to say, hey, art is all around us, not just in museums, not just on walls. Look at this bull, not just as a bull, but as a shape and a form. And sort of open up your aesthetic eye to the world around you. And you might be amazed at what you see. And frankly, for those of us who live in the Northwest, Mother Nature is the grand master at abstract art. You look at that shape of Mount Hood, you look at the skyline out here of the Coburg Hills, the trees, the shapes, doesn't get any more abstract. Okay, let's move around and I'll finish up with one or two more and let you get on and get out of here. So maybe let's, um, let's see here, maybe let's do this where you guys can, can you all see the Chuck Close down here that way you don't have to move? And you guys can maybe move around a little bit so you don't get too tired standing in one place. So let's move down here a little bit and you guys can look at it. Actually, actually, you know what? As long as you're moving this way, let's stop at this Mark Bennett for a second because it's, it's fabulous. So come this way for the Mark Bennett and then we'll do the Chuck Close and then I'll take you back that way. So if we follow what I was suggesting about Roy Lichtenstein, post-World War II, talking about media, the individual in the days of mass marketing and so forth. Then we go to the next sort of generation up. Mark Bennett was born in 1956. So he's coming along right after the pop artist, I mean he was born in, but by the time he's you know, 15, 18, 20, it's 20 years after Warhol's first show in the 60s and whatever. But let's think about one of the big themes in call it, let's say when he's five years old, it's 1961. So let's think about 61 to 70, 75, that kind of time frame. Now, for those of you that remember that time frame, you remember what it was like in 71? Oh, I guess not. Okay. Uh, anyway. okay. What we look at in terms of the American family, probably if we went to the sociology professors here and said, tell us from the 50s to the 70s, maybe one of the biggest themes about American life they'd probably tell us about the breakdown of the family in its traditional way of being married and staying married forever. 
Lots of reasons why, they'll talk about all that, but the fact is divorce rates went up geometrically, right? Huge impact of single family homes, of divorce, I mean, very complex things that we're still all dealing with now, right? So here you have Mark Bennett, he's 11, 12 years old, parents get divorced, very difficult time, okay, he's bouncing from house to house, all those issues that tragically often happens in divorced families. And where is he spending his time? He's spending his time in front of the TV, watching all those sitcoms that we all grew up with that on MeTV you can still see, okay? So I Dream of Jeannie, Gilligan's Island, okay? I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, Jetsons, Flintstones, Rin Tin Tin, Lassie, okay? Um, I mean, on, on, on. And think about what he did then. He watched those shows incessantly. In essence, what he suddenly realized is, my gosh, as my family had a sort of a breakdown and fell apart, my surrogate family really became on the TV, really became those sitcoms that, that they became his family. They became such an important influence in his life. And he counted on, the, on every week, he, they'd be there for him. So then as a young artist, thinking about themes that influenced him because all these artists, they're reflecting their lives, their history, their ethnicity, their, their, their intellectual curiosity, all the aspects. For him, this was the theme. So he spent a ton of time going through all the TV shows. This is the home of Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson, Batman, Wayne Manor. He, he got all the details to architecturally make it perfect. He did a series of these with all those TV shows. Absolutely brilliant. No one had thought of this before. So here you have an artist doing something different than has been done before. And he's got a theme, a burning message that was trying to come out. A, a, a one sort of probably a cathartic crying theme about, hey, this is what happened to me, my experience, my life. I went through this pain and agony. And thankfully, these families were there for me. And he's reflecting this to us for us to all ponder and think about. Okay. Now what you all think about is unique to you because um, did you have parents? Absolutely. Grandparents? Of course. Sisters, brothers? One sister. One sister went to school? Yeah. Okay. You like to eat out, restaurants, eat, use sports, I mean all the activities in your life, right? Now, you had parents too, right? Oh, so you're both the same, you both had parents. Wait a second. You've had totally different experiences, haven't you? thousands and millions of experiences in your lives, just like each of us here. We're all a wonderful mosaic of all the experiences we each have experienced. That's why when each of you look at any of this work, sort of preloaded is a whole, a whole lifetime of emotion, experiences, thoughts, feelings, and that's why each of you look at these things through your own eyes. And that's why art is so critical to everyone and so unique, because we each bring to it all that we've been. So when each of you look at all this, either one, some of us, like me, reflect on actually remembering those TV shows. I can see Batman and Robin in that neat car tearing out of the driveway and whatever, okay? I mean, I remember seeing all who would rush home to see Twilight Zone. I mean, I mean, each of us respond to these things in different ways. You were a bit younger when those came on. You may be seeing them now as sort of, boy, that's what they did in those a long time ago, those old, old Old times, okay? But that's why art is so fascinating and that's why he is up on this wall. A burning passion, he reflected themes of the time, and it lets us be the beneficiary of pondering how uniquely for each of us we take away from this thoughts about ourselves, our life, our relationship to others, family, brothers, sisters, ourselves, what kind of life we want to have, whatever the themes are that, that, that resonate with you. Now Chuck Close down here, amazing artist, born in Monroe, Washington, which is in essence a suburb of Seattle. Uh, unfortunately, he is very, very dyslexic. I guess I'd say fortunate, unfortunately. I should take that a different way, okay? Because we each benefit from the challenges we have. He had a difficult time as a, as a young man. He also has another uh, issue of photo, uh, Jody, what a photo? Uh, what is it? Right. This is a louder. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and that is, he's unable to, to, to recognize faces. It's a very, very rare thing where he, when he sees a face, he can't recognize it. So not only as a young boy, 
Was he dyslexic, so he had a tougher time in school? They didn't know all the things about it then that they don't now. My daughter's dyslexic, okay? But he also had this other issue that he had a hard time recognizing faces, so socially he had a tough time. And then he also had a little bit of a kidney issue, so he couldn't be very athletic. So he started getting into magic, started developing his own, own skills and talents, and then unfortunately, tragically, his father died at 11, his mother got breast cancer, very traumatic time being 11 years old. Okay. But when he was 14, he went to an art exhibition and he saw Jackson Pollock's art. And that was a transformational time for him. Wow, the light went off. He always liked painting and drawing, and he decided, I want to be an artist. Finishes at the University of Washington. He goes to Yale, gets his MFA and BFA in 62 and 63. And luckily for us, and for me, when he was at Yale, there was a wonderful artist named Gabor Petterdy, who was a master printmaker. And Chuck Close writes how Yale has an extensive collection of master drawings, and he would go get Rembrandt and Durier drawings and he, uh, etchings and prints, and he'd look at those and study those. So works on paper had a huge impact on him as a young, young student. He does a lot of abstract art, but then in 1988, he had a sort of a back aneurysm which caused him to basically be, in essence, a paraplegic. He is in a wheelchair and only has use of one hand, and he's done amazing things with just that. Uh, he, in his studio, he has a wall that the, 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 the canvas actually moves up and down because he stays fixed so he can do his work. Now, I say all that to you because now if we put this into context of this work, as I said to you, when I first saw his work, I loved it. I loved it. Why? Because I love colors, I love images, I love portraits. But then why him? Because when the first time I saw his work, I don't know, 25 years ago, whatever it was, it was just different. Now, portraits are as old as they come. On those caves in France, in Africa, I mean, you know, masks, nothing new about portraits. But the way that he keeps working and working and working, that, that medium, that, that portraiture, is unique to him. So a couple things when I see his work. First, just the pure color aesthetic. When you stand back, okay, it looks almost like a photograph, doesn't it? But then come on, start walking forward, go closer, and as you get closer to it, what you'll begin to see is just like, I'm sure many of you like me when I was in grade school, we looked at a newspaper picture and you took a magnifying glass, did you ever do that? And suddenly you see all those Bende dots that Roy Lichtenstein is so famous for. Mr. Ben Day in 1879 created the, the concept that allowed newspapers to publish pictures, in essence. As you walk up closer to it, what you begin to see is this is thousands of little portraits within portraits within portraits. So first, what I see in there is this political theme again about look at us as individuals, just like I was saying about the bull. The way I read this is we're all made up of thousands and thousands of little facets. And even though back there it seemed like this is a portrait of a, of a, of a man, as we come up to it, what we begin to see is this is, this is, this is thousands of, of little portraits. Okay. Brilliantly done. And I think the sort of tension and energy and challenge as you move back and forth to the image just adds more to it. It just makes it alive. Second of all, now that we know his history, how do you not look at this and think about someone coming over their adversities? And there isn't one of us in this room that has had their share of problems. And here he is with the things he had as a young man that many could have given up, but by God, he kept pushing himself, and even with those adversities, one of the biggest artists in the world. There isn't a museum in the world that doesn't have his work. So on just the personal level, because behind each of these is, is, a, is a human being. They get up and put their pants on just like us, or their skirts. So in terms of the personal thing, my gosh. And third, again, he's done it in, a, in his own way. Lastly about this, uh, I mentioned 10 minutes ago about why I like works on paper. Now, prints have been done for 500 years. You can go get those Rembrandt prints and, and uh, amazing. But something phenomenal happened post-World War II. And that was, there were some artists that graduated from 
college and wanted to be artists, but maybe began to realize they didn't have as much talent as some of their classmates, and yet they loved making art. And the first lady that really did this was June Wayne in Los Angeles. She said, you know, I love printmaking, but God, some of my classmates, they're a lot better artists than I am, but you know what? Maybe I'll create my, my, my passion will be helping make prints for them. So she created Tamarind with the idea of saying, hey, artists, come on in and you give us the ideas, you do the, the wood block, you do the etching, you do the copper plate, and we'll do the work for you of printing it and, and doing the business side of getting it distributed to galleries. So she and that program created master printers, and they began to go off to other places like Gemini in Los Angeles that was formed in 62, and Crown Point Press in Berkeley and San Francisco, and ULE and on and on and on. So now what we have is this amazing collaboration. Art's always been a collaboration. I mean, you know, Sistine Chapel, he had lots of assistants. But here we have amazing artists that can come to master print make printers and say, boy, I want to try putting mylar on paper like where Lichtenstein wanted to do. No one had done that. Richard Serra over there went to Gemini in, on Melrose in LA and said, I want a viscosity, I want a thickness to my paint. How do I get the paint to sort of like jump off the wall? They spent nine months exploring automotive paints, aerospace paints, house paints, all sorts of combinations. The artist would probably have never put the time in to have done that. Now in this case with, with, with Chuck Close, okay, this, this, print, 111, this print went through the, the, the press 111 times. Some of his other work, we have a Chuck Close exhibition open last weekend at Pepperdine University's Frederick Weissman Museum. One of the images there went through 246 times. Now think about it, and it ties right into the name of the show under pressure because it was pretty clever Jack Becker to come up with that. However these things are done with a, a, a serograph, a lithograph, an etching, a, whatever, you know, basically you take some paper and you smash it onto a stone, a copper plate, whatever, and it's under pressure, and you pull it off, and the image is there. Well, for these prints, each time you do this, you do it with one color at a time, and then it's got to dry. So this went through the press 111 times. Now, let alone that Chuck Close is basically a paraplegic, okay, he would never have had the time. But other artists of this caliber, think about it. You, you put, you put the, 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 the orange on or some color, and it's in 30 places there, right? 50 places. And you pull it off, and this is an edition of 80. There are probably 10 uh, artist proofs, 10 printer proofs, whatever. So let's say there's 100 in total. You take the paper off, you put it down on a rack, you let it dry for three or four days, all 100 of them. You got a whole room full of them. And then you put the next color on. And you, so this takes you a year or two years to get done. Now for us, the difference of having 111 colors on here versus there being just two colors, and amazing things can be done with two colors, but the richness and the, the, the depth of the, the, of, of the, the energy that this, this has is a result of the, the technical ability to get it done. So this collaboration with these publishing houses today has just made, for me, works on paper take on an even greater appreciation of not only the collaborative effect, but technically doing things for artists they never could have done before. I'll finish up with one more, and uh, well, let me just do one here while we're here, and then I want to go way down there, okay? John Baldessari, he is the leading conceptual artist in the world. What's that mean? And he hates the word. Uh, he was born in, uh, well, conceptual means he's more interested in the idea than in essence the art. The art is merely a vehicle to get the idea across, okay? And Solowit was in that same, same class. So what he did here is with his then wife in Beverly Hills, he got a cockamamie idea and he said, I wonder if I threw three balls up in the air and took photographs, if I could ever take a photograph where they all lined up perfectly. I mean, how would you think of that? Okay, this is an adult man. Okay. And he's come up with one idea like this after another that is just brilliant, totally different. So he took all these pictures and this is throwing three balls in the air to get a straight line. Now, with John Baldessari, he grew up in National City, which is a working class suburb of San Diego. Italian family, father used to buy houses that were being torn down for new subdivisions, and he would take the nails out and reclaim the wood and sell it. They had a garden in the back, 
like good Italian families for fresh vegetables. His mother got him in the arts. She got him into piano lessons in the sixth grade. Then uh, he wasn't sure he liked it so much. He said, how about an art class on Saturday morning? He did, he loved it, and uh, thought he'd be an artist. He ends up uh, uh, getting his art degree, teaching. In essence, he was at UCLA most of his adult life teaching after a, a Cal for the Arts and others. But um, his work initially was never accepted. In fact, one thing he did in the, I should know this date, I think it was 70, 72 or three or four, he basically took an ad out in the San Diego paper, uh, an obituary ad, and said, in essence, John Baldessari's art is dead. He went to a, 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 a funeral home, took all his paintings, had them all put in the, the, the incinerator, burned up, and took the ashes and got a, a, a urn, urn and put, put him in the urn. Okay, unfortunately, a ton of his early art was all lost that way because he was so pissed off that no one was appreciating his art. And he said, that's it, I'm burning it all. Okay? But actually, he did it in a way that was I mean, just oddly brilliant. So he's gone on to be one of the biggest artists in the world. Actually, better almost known in Europe than anywhere else. Amazing man. We've had an exhibition of his and uh, traveled the country, did a book for him, and, and uh, phenomenal. But this, 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 is, this, is, this conceptual art is there was a movement starting really in the 70s where some folks said, Hey, how do we really define art? Saul Witt, whose work is down uh, on the wall down there, he actually got to a point where he didn't want to have anything to do with the art. He would write out instructions as to what he wanted done, send the instructions to the, the printmakers, and say, now do it. He wanted to push the envelope as to how far away you get from the art, and is it still art? A lot of people criticized and said, you know, this is, this is, this is terrible. But it was very, very creative and different. So let's with this move on down now, way down the other way. I want to go to Hung Lu, the, uh, the uh, works down uh, there, and I'll finish with that. This is an interesting area right here. I just asked whether I should go on the longer or shorter, because I don't want you to get too bored here. But uh, this is a fascinating area with this Lorna Simpson, the Ellen Gallagher, the Hung Lu, and the Roger Shiamora. And actually, then we have Enrique Chagoya right here, a brilliant Hispanic artist. So, Let's talk about, again, themes of our time. And this is a tragic place to probably end my talk, because all these artists are talking about a history of, in essence, their people, their culture, their identity, their family. So if we start off with the Hung Lu, she was born in 1948 in China. And her parents were intellectuals. And during the purge, the Cultural Revolution, her parents were taken out of the city, out of their jobs, and thrown onto a farm, a collective farm. I mean, we can all project and start thinking about what that would be like, my gosh. And here, she does these works that reflect her, like all these artists. I mean, think about if you're an artist, where do you get your inspiration from? It's got to come from in here. Okay? So here she has, let's start with this one over here. I mean, you think about China, and we're so blessed here in this building with Gertrude Bass Warner and all those five trips she made in the 30s. We have one of the finest regional collections of Asian art in the world, and Ann Kitagawa, who, where are you? Are you? There you are. If any of you have not had a chance to hear her take you through those galleries, okay, if I'm hopefully a little interesting, she is brilliant and over the top, okay, because I, I tell you what I think I know. She knows what she knows. <laughs> she's incredible, and we're blessed to have her at the museum here. And uh, she's done an incredible job reinstalling some of those rooms that make that stuff come alive again. And, uh, and there's great material to work with. But unless it's sort of organized the right way, it doesn't sort of you know, help us lay folks understand it better. So fabulous job. So looking at this work, you have here someone that's dressed in sort of a royal a courtesan outfit. Whether this is a member of more of a royal family or an attendant to the royal family, it has the, that, that you know that has a, a stature about it. And yet again, she uses an interesting technique where it's not where, where it's very very fluid with the painting. I mean, with her with her style here, okay, with the way she uses her colors, the traditional fan, okay, but also the, if you look at the faces of all her all the work she does, they're very haunting. They're not happy. Okay. They're, they're pensive or sad or you don't quite know, but it adds this wonderful tension to it, I think. And then she has these drips, which to me always I think of tears. 
because I see sadness in her work. I see this wonderful juxtaposition of this incredible 5,000 year old history. I mean, China was way ahead of the rest of the world for thousands of years in so many ways. Such a rich, rich history. And yet we've seen these last 100 years or so, such change and turmoil. Okay, I mean, you know, I think, well, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, I think, you know, it, it's, it's now. And so here she is reflecting her life, going through what she went through, and she's reaching back to the honor of the tradition, but in sort of a stylized, contemporary way, and then a sadness, too, about the loss of one tradition as we forge towards the future. Now, the future, this was the next stage. And if you look at this, work again, okay, she's got these tears all over. She's got this, this family, if you look at them, you can see a younger, you know, it would appear to be more like a three-generational kind of thing, like a grandmother, a daughter, and a, and a, and a mother. Okay? But here they are, and I assume this is either showing what peasant life was like or during that cultural revolution when they were taken back to, which I assume is what this is, back to the farm, and here they're grinding wheat. Okay? And, and look at their faces again. Okay? It seems a, a hopelessness, forlorn, sadness. And yet she's thrown a number of uh, traditional Chinese imagery in it. Okay. So again, if you talk about political commentary, artists or chroniclers of our time, there you have it. Now real quickly, as long as we're here, Roger Shiamora. Roger Shiamora was born in Seattle, and he was born in 1939. 30, His father was a pharmacist. Okay. When he's three years old, what happens? That dark period of our country's history where his whole family was reloaded, relocated to the Nadaka camp in Idaho, the, 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 the prison camp where Japanese Americans were, were then, then taken. Okay. Now, it was lucky for him, his father being a pharmacist, he was able to get a job in Chicago, where therefore not being on the coast, the government didn't think the Japanese were threats, and therefore they got out of the camp. But those memories have always haunted him. And his work, uh, uh, a lot of his work shows, I mean, this work shows life. Here's the barbed wire of the camp, okay? Here they're showing the barracks, and yet traditional clothing, okay? Uh, there are other ones that we did include in this show where, where it shows a, um, a Japanese uh, uh, in, uh, who's in the U.S. Army coming back to see his family and the, the soldiers outside the barbed wire looking in at the family. I mean, you talk about, again, themes of our country, our history, a period in hindsight we're not proud of. And yet the impact to Roger Shiamura and the Japanese Americans, amazing. Uh, there's a show of his at Washington State University that uh, originated, it just opened last night at the Halley Ford Museum. If any of you can drive up to Salem, it is amazing. He went on to get his uh, art degree at the University of Washington, then he went to uh, Kansas and he's taught there at Kansas State for 40 years, wonderful artist. But hitting themes of his people, his culture, and what's his culture? His culture is the American Japanese culture. And his latest work is dealing with um, comic images and how uh, Japan has these uh, tokidoki and um, all these different comic images and how they're Americanized, American images to Japan, and uh, uh, fascinating work. At the same time, we'll finish up with the two, two uh, African-American young ladies here, black artists that are amazing artists who happen to be African-American descent. So Ellen Gallagher over here, uh, uh, this work is called Deluxe. And back to the technical side, this was done at a press in New York called Two Palms Press, that I think is the most innovative publisher in the country. So what is she trying to show us here and deal with? This was an edition of 20. I think all the others are in museums. I was lucky to get this one. But here she's taking Ebony Magazine. And for any of you, I remember when I was about 11 or 12 at the barber shop, suddenly seeing an Ebony Magazine. And it was fascinating, very interesting. Uh, the Johnsons from Chicago that created that magazine became one of the most successful and wealthiest uh, uh, people in the country in pub publishing. And, uh, and yet, looking back on what the theme of the time was for African American black folks in this country, right now it was shocking to us. I mean, there are ads here about uh, uh, whitening your skin. Uh, 
Um, he'll never give you a look unless you whiten your skin. Here, uh, he, he never gave me a second look till Natalia gave me a new look. There are ads about straightening your hair. And there's the whole theme of all those ads in that community of themselves, by themselves, was that you aren't okay as you are. You need to be different to be accepted. A theme that we'd be horrified now because it has universality to it. Okay. And the way she's done this is by taking these covers and then doing this amazing manipulative work to it that you, I mean, you, you, you can look at this 10,000 times and still see things and say, I thought I saw everything. By God, I just saw something I never saw before. So I'll let you at your leisure to come up, but just bring wigs, skin natural. I mean, uh, uh, nurses, duchy, I mean, it goes on and on, on, okay? So back to political commentary, if you wanted to know about what the, 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 the black community internally was thinking at the time about the social mores and being accepted and their themes, here it is. At the same time, Lorna Simpson takes a different approach. She has an Irish uh, mother and a black father, and, um, and uh, what is she trying to, to show us? I think when I see this, I would think most of you think the same thing too, I immediately jump ahead as to who I think the face is of the person with the hair. So I see the blonde one, of course, and there that's right on those Clairol ads. Okay, there's that sor sor sorority, you know, uh, uh, gal of the 50s, you know, uh, uh, and uh, here you see, you know, someone working in a restaurant with the hair net, and, and then she has these wonderful sayings that you've got to come up and read them because it's wonderful how they relate and don't relate to the work. So what's going on here, here, and here? If we had to talk about the world today and look at the age range of all of us here, I know if I asked Hope when you were, when you were in your early 20s and you'd finished here and, and uh, just got married to Chuck and started your family and so forth, did you ever imagine at this stage of your life that the world would be as difficult a place as it is? that there'd be killing in Africa of villages, that we've had uh, issues with ISIS and, and cutting people's throats on TV. And what do you think about with your grandkids and their, and their kids? Okay, what, have, what are we leaving the, the state of the world in? I guess I grew up and you know, thinking by this stage of my life, the world would be a lot more democratic and capitalism would, I mean, families would be, I mean, there'd be a lot happier place. And what we're seeing right now is as difficult as things we saw that we thought in World War II we wouldn't see again. And where's it all coming from? It's coming from this issue that through millennium of man and woman's inhumanity to each other, that somehow because of someone's skin color, racial identity, experiences, village they live in, they want to kill each other. And I think those of us in this country, because we are so blessed to be here with this attitude of acceptance and embracing our cultural and ethnic and and geographic differences. Yes, there are times in this country's history, there are lots of things we were very happy about. And there are issues in Ferguson and others that still need to be worked on. It's never gonna be perfect. But compared to the rest of the world, my gosh. And yet, where do you go to get answers and where do you go to try to understand what is unfathomable? It's right here in this museum. It's seeing these folks with this political commentary trying to help us understand our own views and understand society and humanity. And that's why art is just so critical. So to finish, I appreciate all of your coming. Okay. Uh, you know, um, again, I thank my mother for, for opening up my door to the arts, for all of you who are here. You know, you either did it on your own or someone did it for you, but especially in, who was the teacher? You were, who was, you were talking about being a teacher for a lot of years, okay? We were talking about kids. So let's finish, what were you saying to me? I was, I, was tell, I was telling you that I hope you work with children because your enthusiasm and way of expressing art is just, they would listen, they would love it. It would be a journey. Well, th thank you. And, and the point of that is, the reason why that moment downstairs 25 years ago hit me was at the university level, this is the last chance to get young people and help them make coming here part of their ordinary college experience. So they don't grow up thinking, this is for someone else. This is some elitist thing. And that they, hopefully, they will come here and Jill and Jody and the team and everybody's doing a great job getting them all in. We gotta get more of them in. So they go back to their communities and realize it's pretty neat going to places where there's neat stuff in a building or just all around them. For all of you in the community, think about your neighbor kids. Think about your grandkids, your kids. Think about the next door neighbor. 
pass the word along. As I've said, too many eyes don't wear out the work. Okay? <laughs> the only tragedy is if every person in this community doesn't get a chance to come in here, to first get used to coming into the museum, and second, to let these brilliant, talented, gifted people speak to them. So thank you for coming. Sure. Let's take a, a, a couple, couple questions. A couple questions. Any questions? Um, are you a slug queen fan? Huh? Are you a fan of the slug queen? The slug queens? You know what that is? Gene tradition. No, the oh, one of the I slug know. queens. Well, I drew all of them except for uh, Queen Margaret. I wanted to showcase local uh, people. The, well, is it, there's an art festival going. Yeah, one Great. of them uh, worked or did work here. Holly goes slugway. Great. She works. Okay. <laughs> Support the slug queens. <laughs> you bet. Another question? Something else? show shop clothes and other art to children. And what I tell them is that he painted those dots individually. Am I lying to them? No, he does. Is that how he does it? Well, he does. Okay. So what he's done with that work is he creates the, 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 the first one. Now, again, he does his paintings, but then he takes a piece of paper and he does that whole work with all 111 colors. And then he takes it to, in this case, he works in New York with Pace Editions. They have a, an operation in Brooklyn and one in downtown New York. And he takes it to the printers he's worked with for a number of years and says, gee, this is what I want to do. Uh, or he'll go to them on the front end and say, I've come up with an idea. Uh, he did a number of works with pulp paper where he said, you know what? I want to come up with a, sort of a, a pulpy kind of look to the work. And they came up with the idea of taking, they don't have them now, but these screens over fluorescent lights that were about this big with all those little white squares. And they put that on a piece of paper. And um, have you ever made a cake and decorated it with uh, the frosting? So they yes. took those, those, those tube things that you push the frosting through and they created their own handmade paper and he colored it. And then he squeezed it in all those little, little sections. And then they pulled this thing off and it dried. And he made a number of works that way that are just exquisite. But that's, again, a collaboration where he came up with an idea and working with the, the printers to help figure out technically how to do it, uh, just very, very exciting. So yes, he, he, he creates this work and then says, now, let's now print it. Another question? What are you thinking? What do you want to know? What's your favorite piece? The Chuck Close one? Mm -hmm. Just how it was like all the really unique individual mm -hmm. pieces. Yeah, yeah. What about this Barbara Kruger? Look at that. <laughs> Time based piece. <laughs> all right. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The, the question was Does it make any difference what the addition numbers are? And the answer is no. Uh, not to me. Do some people want to collect just number one or number 10 or number eight or 40? whatever. Uh, generally, they're, generally, they're not differences with the level of the publishing houses, these works being done. They're all really identical. Uh, now, oftentimes, an artist will go back in and do a lot of handwork to a, 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 a print. Or they'll make mono prints that are one, just unique one, one print and not a, an addition. But it doesn't make any difference. And, and there's no difference in the pricing. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Give us a little background about how this, how these pieces were curated, how they were selected for this show. Well, Jack Becker, the director of the Jocelyn Art Museum, picked them originally. This is the sixth and last venue. And what is interesting is, um, in each venue, because the spaces are different, the walls, the ceiling, the color of the floors, um, the work all looks totally. <laughs> totally different. And as I understand, Jody, you actually did the installation with the preparers to, to figure out where stuff would go? Right. Did you have a particular theme in mind as to how you put what you put where? Why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Well, I can, I can briefly just describe the thought that went behind the installation plan. 
So we have one large room, but, uh, and we have two doorways, so people are gonna be accessing the space from either the north or the south. I wanted to have eye-catching pieces that you would see if you came up either staircase, and we use the purple to sort of offset the Damien Hurst and the Kiki Smith. If you start on the far end, we've got sort of the earliest prints by the artists who were really the, the, the movers and shakers in uh, gravitating towards printmaking in the post-war period with Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, moving around to conceptual art as Jordan spoke with John Baldessari and the pop artists. We've got um, the photorealists on the back wall moving to artists who are considering the lines between abstraction and representation with the Roy Lichtenstein, as um, Jordan discussed. Moving on this way, we have artists who are using printmaking as a form of social critique, whether it's an artist like Kiki Smith, who's engaging with um, feminism and what does it mean to be a woman and a woman artist in today's world, to artists such as Helen Gallagher and Lorna Simpson, who are considering their roles not just as women, but African-American women. Looking at um, the immigrant experience, whether it's Hung Lu, who came here from China, looking back to her history and her cultural heritage, um, or at the far end, um, Enrique Chagoya, who um, is a Mexican-born artist living in California, who's thinking about um, the role of Latino immigration. Um, and then on the back wall, if you haven't had a chance to look yet, we have a little section on what is a print and some tools that were loaned to us from the art department here to show you how artists make some of these types of prints. We couldn't fit everything in, but we do have examples of some other prints. So that's a really brief discussion of how um, we decided to lay out this room. Fabulous. Any more? Well, I guess All right. If you have any other questions afterwards, I know Jordan is still here. I'd be happy to talk with you as would I. But thank you very much uh, for coming today. And thank you. 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 Thank you.